What's up, everybody? <clears throat> Welcome to the Wednesday night stream. It's the middle of the week. Hope everybody's having a nice week so far. Hoping we can have a good time painting here today on Wednesday. And we've got a new project to start for the stream. If you haven't checked it out already, we got a new YouTube video up on the Jack Club's Painting YouTube. So make sure to hit exclamation point YouTube, go over there and hit subscribe so you can see all of those new videos. We started a new tutorial series, kicked it off with a new video on YouTube about painting flesh tones. You've seen me paint that kind of stuff here on stream a couple of times before, but uh, not on a model like this. This is kind of a special model. Oogly, what's up? AGZ98 checking in. Yeah, so starting a new tutorial series on this awesome 54 millimeter model. This guy right here. This is, uh, I believe the name of the sculpt is Nash, N-A-S-H, but I don't like that name, so we're gonna find a different name for him. We're gonna call him something different. But this is sculpted by uh, Raul, Garcias Latore, uh, trying to get better at saying his name because he's got a fancy Spaniard name. Uh, but yeah, I got this guy uh, all the way over from Spain. Amazing, amazing model. Um, and uh, it's sold out. Like, it's it's already sold out. This is a limited run sculpt, so I actually don't know if there's going to be any more made than what was already made and sold which makes this dude even more exclusive because he's going to end up being a giveaway on the channel next month. And he's actually going to be the first giveaway under the new system, which uh, we're still working on, but you'll get info on that very soon. So look forward to it. But he's going to be a giveaway here next month in June, and we're going to be working on him. Um, probably not like all of the time until he's like not every single stream until he's done, but we are gonna work on him periodically throughout the rest of this month. And uh, he's also gonna be here on Twitch. It's gonna be on YouTube. Uh, we're gonna alternate between those two mediums for doing the tutorial series on this guy. And the first thing is the flesh tones. So if you wanna see exactly how we got his flesh tones looking like this, then make sure to go over to YouTube and watch that new video. Oh, appreciating? Definitely not my trick. That has been around for many years. <laughs> I don't know who initially came up with that, but that is uh, that is a technique that has been around for a very long time. So feel free to use it. Yeah. So uh, what we're going to focus on today is uh, kind of his lower half. I'm thinking about blocking in uh, these pants and working on those for a little bit, and then working on his boots. And then uh, we'll see where we are from there. But we're gonna be taking our time with this guy. I'm not gonna be rushing through it um, like we normally do, because you know most of my tutorials are how to get your stuff like, on the table as quickly as possible, just looking awesome. But for this guy, we're gonna be taking our time. We're gonna be doing a lot of different stuff on him, trying to make him look exceptionally good because I want this to be a really, really big giveaway for you guys. So um, what I'm thinking for the pants is uh, a blue. We're gonna do some blue on him. Uh, he's also got uh, his uh, belt, which you can barely see, but he does have a belt that's uh, underneath the chain wrapped around his waist. And it's kind of a military style belt, but um, because we can't see too much of it, we're probably just gonna do that in black and just work up some black on that uh, belt, kind of like a black tactical military um, belt made of like canvas or whatever. Um, and then after we get the pants worked on a little bit, then we're gonna switch over to the boots because kind of kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking about, what we wanna do is we wanna work on our pants because we're gonna be doing some airbrushing on them. And when those are done, then we can block in our boots and airbrush on those. And um, in theory, that's going to be the easiest way to airbrush both of these pieces on the model without worrying about overspray. So that's the plan. That's the initial plan uh, to get started. And I'm thinking that when we start working on his boots, we'll also work on the, uh, the shoulder harness 
that he's wearing for his big uh, Desert Eagles uh, because we can just make those the same uh, leather color unless we want to go with black boots and brown leather. I haven't gotten that far yet. You know how I kind of like to just do things as they come to me rather than totally pre-plan a paint scheme. Chrome shades. We'll be doing a sunglasses effect. I don't think we're going to do um, like mirror finish shades. Uh, but we can definitely do like some uh, some black shades or maybe some some blue shades, something like that, like some aviators. I think that's what they're kind of supposed to be. They're supposed to be like some military aviator style glasses. Um, so we'll probably just end up doing those in some kind of just dark sunglasses style workup. Yeah. And kind of the idea, the idea that I that came to me as I was I was painting this dude's flesh tones, I was like, you know what this dude looks like? It's like, what if it's like a slayer, right? Because we have you have like dwarf troll slayers who are known for like their two axes and uh, dyeing their their beards and their hair uh, orange. And you know how I love my slayers, and we've got our our shade spire slayers uh, that we made, and then of course we did some slayers for the Blood Bowl team. So you know I love my Slayers. <clears throat> so I'm thinking what we're going to do with this guy is he's going to be like a modern day Troll Slayer. Like he traded in the axes a long time ago. They got rid of the axes and they upgraded to the guns. And so now instead of dual wielding some Slayer axes, he's dual wielding some Desert Eagles. And that's what they're fighting Trolls with. So we're just going to roll with that idea. So he's got this kind of military haircut. You can see it's just, it's not it's not entirely a mohawk. It's kind of it's 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 like a, a high and tight. It's a little long on top. That's pretty close. So I think if we do some Slayer esque kind of workup on his uh, on his hair there, that'll look really cool, and it'll pair well with our other colors. We can do the blue pants just like uh, like a Slayer would have, and he's got these kind of badass rock and roll style. Uh, like bracers he's got one that's like this little metal kind of square plate and then some spikes of course he's got his good old brass knuckles there and then this one like driving glove looking thing that he's wearing and then of course we'll get into all the other details like the dog tags the pistols the chains his sunglasses and the uh the big fat cigar that he's chewing on but first things first is we're going to start working on the pants okay and what I want to do to start off on the pants, just to get back to kind of a neutral, a neutral base to work up off of, is just black it out. Just then, like, take some some model color black. We got our, our model color black here, and we're just gonna thin that out and base in his pants, so that when we put in our blues, the blue is not going to be tinted by being painted over these, uh, like the overspray from the flesh tone, right? Ophi, 164, what's up? Welcome to the stream. Starting work on our Slayer here. So we gotta think of some names. We got we gotta think of like a good name, good solid name. And you know, I'm like terrible at naming stuff, which is why I let you guys come up with the names. So we're going to need to come up with a good name for this dude. <laughs> Ophi164, thanks for that host. Appreciate you. And hair on him. This is probably going to take a couple of coats because I want this to go on really thin. He's got a lot of detail sculpted into these uh, pants that he's wearing. And I don't want to get rid of any of that through hand painting, which is why we have our black paint thinned out so much. And for those of you who are kind of getting into painting, trying to trying to grow your hobby muscles, hitting the hobby gym, so to speak, by hit, hanging out here on Twitch and uh, checking out videos on YouTube, I highly recommend finding a really cool 
54 millimeter or 75 millimeter scale model that you can sink your teeth into because um, one thing that you'll notice is that you can apply all of the same painting techniques that you can on like a 32 scale or a 28 scale model onto these. It's just a little bit broader and you don't have to work so hard on the details. And they're just so much fun. Like when you when you go up to a 54 mil from something like a 28, like something from 40K or from Age of Sigmar or Infinity or what have you, like it's just so fun because it's it, it's not I would I don't want to say it's like easier. Like for me it's easier because I have a ton of experience, but um when you switch scales up to that kind of middle ground, that 54 millimeter scale, it's just it, accomplishing your the goals that you have on the model is a little easier to do. And it's just an overall, it's a much more, it, it's a, it's a, it's much more fun to, to work on these models than it is the uh, 28 mil stuff. So there's our initial coat. You can still see some of that, some of that kind of like light flesh tone stuff peeking through because we put it on so thin. So we'll just let that dry up and then do a second coat once it's dry. Zuel Zaji, what's up, friend? How's it going? Also doing a little bit different music um, because one of the things that I want to do with this model is end up porting the streams over to YouTube and that's always been kind of a hassle in the past because of the the music stuff like if it ends up having like some super obscure copyright on it or whatever it like totally keeps your video from being uploaded um because like I don't care about making money off of YouTube the money that uh, content creators in our hobby make off of YouTube is dog shit anyways but with the way that YouTube has evolved over the years it's basically like oh well this has this has copyright, so you can't even you can't even upload it. Like, so it's super annoying. And what we've been doing over the past get that light out of there, what we've been doing over the past few weeks um, is just not even worrying about YouTube because we're making our our weekly video for YouTube, um, and just not even worrying about the streams. But I want people to see the stuff that we do on this guy in between the YouTube videos. Um, because Twitch likes to take down the videos after 30 days. So if somebody comes and they find the first video like uh, three or four months from now, I want them to be able to watch that and then check out the recording of the live stream to see what we do in between those studio videos so they get the full picture. So right now we're going with some rights-free music. Um, once we get through uh, this project, um, we can go back. And like I said, since we're not going to be working on him, every stream until he's done uh we can alternate back and forth between um the rights free stuff and uh the better you know music that we enjoy all the time kalini what's up jader oh jade mermaid i was gonna say jader maid uh jade mermaid this is a 54 millimeter model uh the name of the sculpt is nash n-a-s-h and it's sculpted by raul Garcias Latore. Um, let me see if I still have the. No. So if the somebody else asked me that the other day, the easiest way to find his website because it's kind of obscure is if you just Google fifty four mm like fifty four millimeter fifty four mm Nash N A S H, and look for Raul's website. You can find it. Um, I looked earlier and it's out of stock. So I knew when I picked it up, it was limited. Um, that's why I wanted to get my hands on it because the model just spoke to me and I really wanted to, to paint it for you guys. So I, I actually don't know. I can't confirm um, or tell you one way or the other whether or not there will be more of it. I just know that as of right now, it's out of stock. So um, right now, the only way to get one is to either like scour the internet and see if there's any available on like eBay or from other sellers. Or alternatively, you can wait uh, and check out while we're painting him and he's going to be a giveaway, uh, on the channel here once he's done. 
I'm going to be doing a giveaway for him um, at the midpoint of next month. And of course, he'll be he'll be fully painted to a display level. And I was looking at his base. Um, his base is a little bland. Uh, let's say it's a little bland. So here's his base. Um, the model itself is kind of cartoony. It's kind of comic booky, and I like that. You guys know that I prefer that style of things. And the base is that way too, but it's a little farther down on that spectrum than I would kind of want it to be. You can kind of see that it's just a little boring looking. Like there's not a whole lot going on with it. And uh, I'm thinking what I'm going to do is we're going to find a really cool kind of display style uh, base from either our friend over at Elric's Hobbies or maybe Secret Weapon Miniatures. Um, or maybe get um, some, we're going to find some kind of cool resin base and I want to do a display thing, a uh, plinth, I think they're called, like a little display, one of those little, you know, maybe like uh, 20 millimeter tall uh, wooden dowels that you see models displayed on where their base is attached to that. I kind of want to do one of those for this guy because he is going to be a display level model. Um, I know that Slowfuse makes those, so I was going to talk to him and see about getting one. Or, I don't think he makes them, but he sells them. Um, but I'm going to be looking over at Elric's and see about getting a cool base. Uh, this guy sits comfortably on like a 40, but I'm thinking we should do a 50 millimeter because that's kind of enough to have him displayed on top of it and also like enough of that base to kind of tell a story so he's not like squished on top. If that makes sense, like I don't want him to kind of have too much uh be be hmm. i don't want the base to be too small basically so we're gonna we're gonna look around and i'm gonna i'm gonna find a good base to put him on that kind of matches the character let's see I'll probably do another thin coat for a model color black like I was saying before, basically what we're doing here is we're just creating a neutral background to start our blue workup on because he had a lot of overspray on his pants from doing the flesh workup that we did in the YouTube video. You kind of see that on the chains around his waist where everything is kind of flesh colored. Uh, and so what I want to do is have our blue start off going over a nice dark black tone so that the blue is not tinted by the flesh tone that we would be painting it over. So we're just doing like a couple of really thin coats on his pants here because I don't want to lose any of the detail on that sculpt. I just have to go on super, super thin. And that's a good thing about the model color especially the model color black is you can thin it out extremely thin and it still has really really good stick and coverage you can see just doing like two um i would go so far as to say super watery coats like these were really thin the way i thinned them out um and our coverage is fine like super dark coverage Valley Slim, um, when I'm doing single model stuff, I almost always use the Tetrad. Um, the Triads are good for um, army, like whole army compositions, I find. Um, but for single models, like standalone projects, I prefer Tetrads because there's more going on there and you can, ha you can have more fun with the, uh, the color scheme. Uh, just like some extra elements to it. But if we're talking like a whole like force or if you're doing like a whole blood bowl team or like a whole army i prefer um the triads oh yeah there's the uh the poster this awesome poster it's mirrored the the awesome poster here from kalini hanging up on the wall in its place of honor the samurai v conquistador 2 poster oh man it's so good I was a bit upset because I only have two poster um, frames, and it was too big for one, but too small for that one. So 
I ended up, I had to go with that one because obviously the other one was too small. So there's there's a little bit of like cardboard peeking through around the around the edges, but it's fine. You know what I should do while we wait for this paint to dry real quick is I can I can actually go to the color wheel that I use because it's a really a really cool little URL thing that's super easy to use. Um, and I'll, I'll make a command for it, but that's the color wheel that I use. And I almost always use tetrads for single minis and, uh, triads for, for armies and teams and things. Uh, but we can do is make a command so that if anybody asks about a color wheel or which one I use, All right, somebody do, well, I'll do it. Be faster. There we go, cool. So now you can just do exclamation point color wheel and the bot will pop that out. Yeah. All right. So let's get out our blue that we want to use. And if you've been around the channel long enough, you've probably seen me use these blues, but um, I'm kind of doing this as, as much for you guys as I am for the YouTube side of things. So I'll be using my favorite three sets of blues to do a blue workout. And we're going to start off with Vallejo Model Color Dark Prussian Blue. Super, super dark navy blue. Beautiful, rich color. I really like using it. And we're basically just going to do the same thing that we just did with the black. We're going to thin it out really, really thin. With these darker model color paints, they're super, super densely pigmented. So you can thin them out and get them really watery. And they still cover great. And we'll just start basing in our pants with that. You can see how watery it is. And when we start doing our blues, I'm going to try to make sure that I don't get any of this blue paint on our belt here just because we want that to, to end up being black. So. I don't need to paint on top of it. I'm not going to. Yeah, it's a pretty nice little color wheel. I really like using it. Helps me out. Counter actual, thanks for those bits. I really appreciate that.
Don't want to try to force this paint to cover on this initial coat because it is so thin. So I'm just going to make sure our first coat is nice and smooth and we'll just let it sit for a minute. Let that dry. As cliche as it is, uh, you know, two thin coats usually does you good. So we got that nice black background for that blue to go over so it's not tinted. It's getting that pure dark Prussian blue going on there. And so we'll just let that dry up. Let's see, I want to use one of my other little rubber stompers, but Make sure there's no dust on it so dust doesn't go in the model. There we go. And like normally, when we're working on something like this, if we were doing our our uh, our usual tutorial kind of thing, I would be like, all right, while you're waiting for that blue to dry on the pants, let's like block in something else, right? Just to, you know, make sure that we're steadily working and, and keeping busy and uh, getting this guy, you know, closer and closer to being done as fast as possible. But because we're taking our time with this guy, I'm not gonna worry about anything else. We're gonna take every single thing one at a time and uh, make sure that we're doing everything as, as good as we can to make it look its best. So that's why we're taking the time to stop in between coats, let it dry, do multiple coats, making sure our colors are where they need to go and doing all these workups separately. In Smither, what's up? How's it going? Got to play some Blood Bowl today. I was pretty excited by that. Take the uh, take the dwarf team down to the shop, roll some dice, get kind of a learning game in. I really like how Blood Bowl Two, um, the video game, is is basically a one to one representation of the the tabletop game just in digital space. So if you if you get if you play that and you grasp the mechanics of the video game, you can transition right to the tabletop game and basically know exactly what you're doing. The only difference being that you have to learn when dice rolls occur and how to roll them because the game does all that for you. Like for kickoff events, there's there's dice that you roll, there's a chart you consult. Game does that automatically. You never you don't see that. When you go to block or tackle or blitz somebody, just dice just like pop up and you just click on them to roll them, right? All that pops up. You don't have to calculate any of that stuff. Whereas on the tabletop, you need to, you know, see who is engaged, who is unengaged, and figure out, you know, how many dice you're going to be rolling based on the strength values. Um, for your dodge stuff, you need to look at your, your agility stat and you know, see what kind of uh, modifiers there's going to be. You just have to learn that part. And that part's super easy. That's just all stuff that you end up memorizing. But as far as like basic game mechanics go, the video game is great for teaching you those. So if you're interested in getting into Blood Bowl and you want to try it out without, you know, buying into the game itself and buying models and stuff and worrying about, you know, like, oh, what if I don't like it? I've already bought these models or blah, blah, blah. Well, you can get to get the video game and just play that. Painting up base for the Leviathan. Awesome. I'm going to be doing one of those in the near future. A Leviathan. How they do? Oh, I got stomped. Like, uh, it was like two zip to the Skaven before the half. And that's kind of what happens. Like, when you play a slow, methodical team like the Dwarves, and you're matched against a team that's very fast, that has very high movement value and you know like reasonably good agility if you mess up one time 
Like if you have a really bad turnover or if you just get super unlucky, uh, unlucky on some blocks or you leave uh, somebody out of position where they can avoid uh, your tackle zone with their high movement values, like they will score a touchdown on you immediately. Um, and that's just part of the learning curve. Like I'm used to playing the video game. I'm used to how that all goes down, but then you transition that to the tabletop and, you know, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm used to seeing the board from a different perspective on the game than in real life. So if I had one guy in a square and if he was one over to the right, um, that Skaven gutter runner would not have been able to just run by free. He would have had to make an agility check. Um, just like little things like that that you need to learn on your own by playing the tabletop game. And of course, I was he, had, he scored a touchdown like in his first turn because um, I messed up. And you know, he capitalized on it like you like you should if you're if you're uh, playing to win. And then um, on my turn, I was marching up the field at the cage around the ball, like everything was going well. And then you know, just a couple of bad blocks that didn't go my way, and um, I had to try to move. I had to try to like reposition and go start going up the field, and that left a flank exposed, and I needed to do like three more things to make sure that I could, you know, that play would work out and I had a turnover and he was able to just like swarm around the ball carrier, get all of his rats into position. Of course, easy tackle on the, on the runner and then fumble the ball. He picks it up, runs it in for an immediate touchdown, like, um, on like turn five. So it's like, okay, so I've got, I'm down two zero. I've got three turns to, Get a touchdown, which is not going to happen. It's almost impossible with dwarves unless you just get super lucky and just stun like five dudes in a row and just can move that cage right up the field. Um, and then I and I needed to clock in for my shift at the store, uh, so I was just like, you know, <laughs> you know, if this if we take this into the second half, it's going to be like four or five to zero. You know, it's just not going to happen. But it was fun. Like it was a lot of fun. Like don't get me wrong. Ah, uh, you don't need Tabletop Simulator because Blood Bowl 2 is exactly the way the game is played on the tabletop. It's just a video game, and it has animations. And it's amazing. So if, if you want to play Blood Bowl, um, but not do it on the tabletop, or maybe you don't have people to play with you, um, just get Blood Bowl 2. And it's, it's a really awesome game. It's exactly the way you play the game on the table. It's just that a lot of the stuff that you would normally like consult charts for and roll dice for is streamlined in that game. Yeah, they're stupid fast. Like, gutter runners, like, you have to, like I was saying, like, the irony is that, I like, somebody was asking me, like, how to play a Bashy team against somebody like Skaven or, or Dark Elves, and I was like, you have to, your positioning has to be really good, you have to play it super safe with your blocks, and if you make, like, one mistake, if you, if you have, like, one really bad turnover, or you make, like, one really bad mistake and leave your flank open or something, like, they're going to swarm you, they're going to get that ball, and they're immediately going to score because you can't get to them. And that's exactly what ended up happening. But it was a learning experience. I learned a lot transitioning to the tabletop version of it, so I think I'm ready to actually start playing in our league um, with all the rules and all that in the tabletop. Uh, good to go. And it's just going to be a little different because um, when, you play on the, when you play in Blood Bowl 2, you can position the camera however you want to see like the view of the, the field, however you want. And there are certain other things that you can toggle on and off. Like there's a, t there's a, a feature where if you want to see what every player has, as far as skills go, you can toggle that on so that, you know, like, okay, well, if I want to, if I want to blitz that dude, he's got these skills. And if I want that to go off, I need to set up some other players first or, you know, that like this guy is a priority. He needs to get taken out immediately. I don't want him running amok on the field. Um, that kind of thing. Whereas with the tabletop version, you have to see what team they're running and what skills they have. And you just kind of have to know that that like what they got. You, just, you need to know what a gutter runner does. You need to know what a witch elf does. You need to know what a chaos warrior does and what skills he has. 
Um, whereas in the game, all that all that information is visual and immediately available to you. Just like in 40k, you just need to like you just need to learn stat lines and what skills are and who has them. Yeah, Nuffle definitely hated me during that game. I like that turnover was so upsetting. Like, because if I had if if that turn had gone well, I would have tied it up within the next turn because of how I had positioned the board. If I just if that one thing had gone off and I was able to, you know, move the ball carrier forward into the cage that I had set up and then make like two other blocks so that he couldn't get into my cage, he would have been gone. And I, it would have been tied 1-1. But that turnover fucked me hard. Um, actually, it's a fairly simple game. Like, mechanics-wise and rules-wise, really, really simple game. Uh, it's one of those games where, like, really, really easy to grasp, to get into, and then the super high levels of play, um, it takes a while. Like, really easy to learn, super hard to master. Especially, excuse me, especially depending on what team you want to do, because teams have wildly different play styles and characteristics uh, between them. So, yeah, that's what happens is the strategy, the strategy. It's like it's a lot like chess. Like there's a difference between like knowing how to play chess and like knowing what everything does and like actually how to play and then knowing how to think three moves ahead of your opponent in terms of like probability to figure out what the best course of action is. Like it's it's very much like that. Yeah. It's like, if he moves here, like, I need to do this, that, and the other thing to counter it. And then if, like, he does this move, I need to I need to make this formation to, to make sure that I can set this up for, like, the turn after that. Like, it's a lot of, it's a lot like that. Like, you have to, you have to really think about it. All right. Cool. I think we can put another coat on this dude. Yeah, chess with RNG. <laughs> I was kind of upset because, like... The, the way the dice were rolling is I was making blocks. I was like, awesome, making blocks. I was um, pinning armor. I was like, oh, yeah, pinning armor. And then I would roll for the the pin armor effect, and I would roll, like, super low. And it's so, like, nothing would happen. I was like, god damn it. It's like multiple times I would roll, like, an 8 or a 9 or, like, a 10 or 11 on the armor pin roll. And then on the the outcome of the armor pin i would roll like a four <laughs> like so it was that that part of it was frustrating um because i mean like that will happen that's just dice rolling um and i just wasn't able to bash him into a situation where he couldn't just like run all over the place which is kind of what you have to do when you play super high mobility teams like skaven is you just need to like obliterate their line of scrimmage and um, focus on their gutter runners and get them out of the game as fast as possible. And it's like Dwarves versus Skaven is actually like a really solid mashup because of the skills that Dwarves have. Like we have Block, which is um, most Skaven, other than the Blitzer, no Skavens have Block. Um, we have Tackle, which is really, really good because uh, tackle negates the dodge skill, which gutter runners have. So it keeps, it keeps um, the you know keeps them in line. We've got thick skull, so it's really hard for the Skaven to uh, knock our guys out or injure us. Okay, just check it to make sure there's no like thin spots. Okay, looks good. Nice solid base coat. And then after that's dry, we'll go do some air Russian. Let me see.
Uh, so... Um... Honestly, what it looks like to me, Oogly, is that you didn't dry brush enough. Um, it could just be the light of the picture, but to me it looks like not enough of the texture was uh, picked out by the dry brush post-wash. Um, I mean, it definitely, like, if, if you had a whole army on bases that look just like this with finished models on top of them, it would look great. Like, there's nothing wrong with this base. But if you want more contrast, you want more of that texture detail to pop out, I think what you need to do is um, start off with a more medium color from your base coat, dry brush it a little heavier to get more of that detail to pick out a little bit, and then go to your brightest color. Because it looks like, like you've only gotten just the bare tippy tops of this, this uh, texture detail, and a lot of that mid... That mid-level detail hasn't been picked out at all. that dry up a little bit more then we're gonna start we're gonna start doing some airbrushing on these pants some airbrushing going I was doing a playing around with a conversion yesterday I was kind of bored so I wanted to just kind of to work on something and uh, I put this guy together towel towel suit commander in the style of Dawn of War 2, if you remember playing Dawn of War 2, the uh, the Tau commander that uh, was the leader of their forces in that game had a special a special suit. And this is kind of rough, um, but ended up coming out okay. I still need to do a lot of cleanup on it. You can see there's lots of little seam lines and little uh, dried gluey bits that need to get sanded down and cleaned up, uh, especially on seams like this. You need to sand those down. But... Uh, I thought this would just be kind of like a fun project to do. Um, I've been wanting to do uh, a conversion like this for a while. There's a There's been a PDF of how to do this floating around for years, years and years. Um, basically, all you need is like one crisis suit, this box of Tau stealth suit teams, and like two Space Marine backpacks. Um, I kind of ended up doing my own thing with it. Uh, it changed some elements, but this is the basic idea. Yeah, I think it came out okay. Um, so once we get him cleaned up and get some paint on him, he'll uh, he'll be looking pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to doing like a fun little fun little project um, with this guy. And I asked somebody to donate the the kits, like a towel player that I know to donate the kits. So I promised that like if he just gave me the kits to do it for free, that I would paint it and I'd give it back to him fully painted. So it's been. A really long time. It's like he gave me the kits before Adepticon, and I just now have been able to uh, do the conversion. So I want to make sure that he finally gets that painted model at some point. The missile pod? Nah, he's he is the way he is. I thought about it, but I honestly just like couldn't find a place for the missile pod that looked good. So he's just he is as he is. He's just gonna have like the plasma and the burst cannon. Because he that's kind of what he starts off as um, in the game. He's got like uh, a, a burst cannon and then you can put in like a second burst cannon or like the plasma gun. And then, you know, I put like the little uh, invul shield disc. I forget what the system is called, but he's got like a little invul shield disc um, on his shoulder there. So, yeah, it'll look cool. Let's see, what are you looking at? Still a little bit. I want that paint to fully dry before we start spraying air on it. My construction paper will sit still. An army of them? Ugh. The conversion is hard enough. Like, the conversion is very tricky. Um... I'll post the URL to the uh, 
That's that's not the right link. Uh, this uh this has been floating around for quite some time. If you haven't seen it, and it is a very intense conversion. Like you need uh, a jeweler saw, you need a super sharp hobby knife to do some of these cuts and some of these like part conversions. And I highly recommend if you want to do it, you get more sprues than uh, than what is recommended in the instructions because. It is definitely a conversion that uses all parts of the buffalo, and if you fuck up one of those pieces and don't have something to replace it, you're just you're done. Which is kind of what ended up happening with this guy is there's some things you have to do with the crisis suit or the the stealth suit body, so you can you maybe see some of the crisis suit body in this shoulder pad and in this like collar piece uh, right here on it, that goes around the head uh, camera, and if you mess those up, then you can't do other pieces, which is why I had to add in these pieces on the chest because it calls for using more bits from the cutoff of the the stealth suit uh, piece. And th just doing these pieces, uh, like the head and uh, this piece and these little packs back here is really tricky. It's it's really hard to get those angles perfect. So um, if, you, if you take your time and don't get frustrated and have some extra parts on hand for for human error, then you can easily do this conversion. But that's something that I, I, I've done it a couple of times in the past and uh, I hadn't done it in so many years that I'd forgotten. And I go to do this one and I, I messed up one of the things and I was like, oh shit, I'm not gonna be able to finish the chess piece because I messed this thing up because I didn't have any more parts. So he, he gave me one crisis suit and, and one box of stealth suits and that's all I had. Where did I get the dwarf? It's from uh, a sculptor named uh, Raul Garcias Latore. So if you Google that name, you can probably find his web store. But this was a limited run uh, mini, and it's out of stock. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be making any more. So um, like bookmark it. Keep an eye on it. He might make more. I don't know. Um, I picked one up as soon as I saw it, and I'm glad that I was able to. So if, if no more get made, then that just makes this guy all the more exclusive and he's already painted. So it'll be a really awesome giveaway next month. Matt Aarons, what's up? Hannah, what's up? How's it going? Beautiful. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we're just working on our dwarf dude here. Waiting for some of this paint to dry. We're, we're being very meticulous with this um, with this model because we want it to turn out really good. So I'm waiting for these thin coats of paint. You can see kind of right there the top of his boot and in some of these creases, we're still waiting for that paint to dry. So um, kind of like what I was saying, if we were doing this like a normal project that we do on stream, I would be saying like, oh, well you wait for this paint to dry, work on this other piece or do this other step so that we're, we're getting this out as fast as possible, like hitting the tabletop. But this guy isn't a tabletop model, he's a display model. So we're gonna treat him as such. And what that means is that our main focus right now is the pants. And we're gonna work on those pants until we get into a, a point where we like. And we wanna put all of our focus and all of our energy into that workup. So putting on our thin coats, we're waiting for them to dry, we're, you know, doing all that stuff. So if I was just painting this guy to get him done, what I would be doing while I was waiting for the pants to dry is I'd be like cutting in the detail on, you know, like his hair or this shoulder harness or these grenades or something like that, right? And then once that paint is dry, go back to it, waiting for that step to dry, we go do something else. But we're focusing on one thing at a time because we want this to end up being a really, really, really good looking model rather than a quickly done model that looks good for the tabletop. Things are going good. Had a pretty good day today. Played some Blood Bowl. Uh, pulled the shift at the Games Workshop. Just painting on this dude. If you haven't uh, already, hit exclamation point YouTube and go over to my YouTube channel and uh, 
watch the newest YouTube video. I won't tell you to subscribe. You can subscribe if you want to, uh, if you like my content. But uh, we have a new video up on YouTube of how we got this skin tone done. So that was the first tutorial video on this guy. So uh, we're going to be alternating back and forth between Twitch and YouTube. So if you want to see how we got from gray resin to the flesh work up here, uh, head over to YouTube and watch that video. And then, um, like I said, today and tomorrow, we're going to be focusing on the pants and his, uh, his combat boots. And then the next video is going to be um, on YouTube because we're going to be alternating. So uh, for this weekend, we'll be working on a separate project, some, some short, more fun projects, and we'll be coming back and forth uh, to this guy so that um, he ends up looking like a really awesome display model. And he's going to be on um, a giveaway in June, so next month. He's going to be the first giveaway of our new uh, giveaway system since we're no longer going to be doing top donator giveaways. Um, haven't talked about that too much because I'm still working out uh, the kinks in the system. When I bring that system online here, I want to make sure that it's uh, perfect for, for you guys and for my end. So when I get all of that uh, lined out, Y'all be the first to know. We'll talk about it. I'll let you know exactly how it's going to work. We're going to promote it on the social media stuff. But uh, what I can tell you right now is it is going to rely on club points. So uh, club points is going to be a thing. And uh, it's still going to be... It's it's not going to be a top donator situation. Because one thing that we learned through doing top donator giveaways here on Twitch is that it's very exclusive. And I know that sometimes exclusive is good, but... When it's exclusive in the meaning that it excludes everybody but the top 1% of people that can throw down a lot of expendable income on minis, um, people end up not really wanting to care about the top donor giveaways or they don't want to watch the painting process of something they know they'll never get their hands on. So our new system is basically a way for everybody to have a fair chance to win. Um, but if people want to, um, let's say... Uh, pad their bets then there's a way for them to do that too but it gives everybody a chance to win it's all it's all random chance yeah so because that's one thing that we noticed is that like some people would be like okay well i want to try to win this but this is this is my spending limit and then you would have other people come in and they'd be like oh and then they just their spending limits like way up here and you know that it, it kind of gives the feel bads to a lot of people and I don't want to do that anymore. So um, I'll be straight up with you and tell you right off the bat that it is a way that gets me my money for the model because um, this is the top donator giveaways is the only way that I make profit off of the channel, if any at all, because that's not the main focus. But um, it's a fair way to make sure that you guys um, aren't taking advantage of and I'm not getting taken advantage of. So it's a, it's a much fairer system. And I think that's going to work out a lot better. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I can give this guy a little bit of air. And have this dry up a little bit. Key Lime Prime with a huge raid. Man, I appreciate that so much. What's up, all the people from Key Lime's channel? Ugly, yeah, you bring up a good point. So the other the other thing I was going to say before Keylam came in is that the other uh, big change for the new system... There it is. The other big change for the new giveaway system is that we are going to transition into a monthly reset for club points. And um, we talked about this a little bit last week when I initially announced the new system. Um, so if... if that's something that's going to be um, an issue for you. If you're upset by that, then like feel free to send me a message and I'll figure out a way to make it right. But um, kind of what the plan is, is that near the end of this month, um, we're going to be doing kind of a, a club points fire sale, if you will. And we're going to be doing a ton of little giveaways so that people can burn off their club points before they reset. And then as we go into that new system at the start of June, um, we're going to be doing a monthly reset for club points. Kalex, thanks for that follow. Welcome to the channel. Bill Neary, what's up? Key Lime, what's up, dude? Thanks again for that raid. Welcome, everybody, from Key Lime's channel. So 
Um, what we're working on today is this really awesome 54 millimeter sculpt from a sculptor over in Spain. His name is Raul Garcias Latore. He does amazing sculpts. So if you look him up, you can find his web store. Uh, this guy, uh, the sculpt is called Nash, N-A-S-H, but I wasn't a fan of that name. So we're going to have to think of a new name for this guy. But um, basically the idea is that this guy is this like modern day badass dwarf guy. Um, and we're painting him kind of like what if down the road uh, in the future, the dwarf troll slayers traded in their axes for guns. And so instead of having twin slayer axes, this guy has got twin desert eagles. And he's chilling out with his uh, super badass look. He's got his shades, got his cigar, got a, a belt made of, of chain link. So we're just working on him. Um, we did the flesh tone workup in a YouTube video. So if you hit exclamation point YouTube, a link will pop up to my YouTube channel. And you can catch that video there. And in that video, it's super short to the point. We just did this whole flesh workup. Chewy MP and the Rizzle Sean Dizzle. Thanks for that follow. Appreciate you guys coming into the channel. Shadow Run Slayer. Yeah, kind of that's kind of the idea. Skojo123, thanks for that follow. Yeah, and so basically we're gonna be alternating um, between YouTube and Twitch for this tutorial series. Working on this guy. Sabat with a sub, let me get some hype for Sabat. Keep coming in with that sub. Um, and today we're focusing on his pants. So um, at the start of the stream, we uh, re-blocked in the pants with some flat black because he had a lot of overspray Hi, from the flesh workup. The All aboard. Choo -choo. There it is. Um, and then we took our dark Prussian blue and put that over the black so um, that our blue would not be tinted by the light colored flesh tones that were oversprayed onto the pants. And as this paint is now pretty much dry, we can start airbrushing on our pants. Yeah. Oh shit, son, we just hit 1,500 followers. Mm. Mm, feels so good. Love all of you people. You guys are the best. I'm gonna have to think of a big old giant giveaway to do for 1,500 followers. We'll have to do that tomorrow. Man. Do you really believe your own hype that much? I am the hype! 100% accurate. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for you uh, party a few people that just came in and followed, getting us over that 1500 hump. The 1500 hump. Oh man, feels good. All right. Hornsfan01, thanks for that follow. Wonder if that's a Longhorn fan or if they just really like horns. All right, let's get some airbrushing going. All right. <laughs> Horns fan, yep. With the burn orange label, knew it. That's what's up, hook'em brother. Oh, this is the same paint. All right, so we did our dark Prussian blue as the base coat for our pants. And what we're gonna do now is go up to regular Prussian blue. Get that in the airbrush mixed up. So you can see this is this is our dark Prussian blue up to our Prussian blue, which is a normal, very, very pretty uh, primary blue color. And we're gonna be softly airbrushing that over these pants to get our highlights going. And um, if, you've, if you've been with the channel long enough, you've seen me use these blues quite a bit. They're my favorite blue workup. I love the colors. But as this is a tutorial series, and we have a lot of new people, and this is also going to go up on YouTube, so I want to make sure that uh, I'm explaining which colors that we're using, even though the majority of you have already seen me use these colors before. Get that mixed up in the airbrush with some flow improver. Make sure that our paint doesn't speckle. We're going to turn down our air quite a bit using my handy dandy little air dial on our hose. Let's see, speckling a little bit. Try to work out the kinks here. All right. 
and then we're just going to start very lightly coming in with our Prussian blue. Kind of what I'm thinking with this is I want to get kind of that effect that you see with um, with jeans nowadays. I think it's called like stonewashed or some some such, where kind of the front of the thigh and the shin, and then the back of the thigh and the calf are much lighter, kind of faded denim. So that's where we're going to be building up the majority of our highlights. And we're not going to get into that kind of uh, uh, blue-gray, almost white of denim. We're going to be working up through the blues, give it more of a kind of a cartoony comic book. Fascinated 12. Thanks for that follow. But that's the effect that we're kind of going for. That's the look of these pants is that we want the pants to look a little bit more faded on these sections. So you were kind of building up that highlight there. The the transition between dark Prussian blue and regular Prussian blue is a little subtle, but it's it needs to be there for when we do our blue green, which is coming up after this. Because if you do blue green directly over dark Prussian blue, it's a little bit too much of a contrast transition. It's a little too harsh. So the Prussian blue is just kind of like an in-betweener color. Rump to bump. <laughs> Good name. Thanks for that follow. Welcome to the stream. And we're just going to creep it around a little bit. that you start seeing the shadows of our dark Prussian blue in those areas that haven't been highlighted up yet hit the front one more time chewy uh, this is a, a limited edition uh, sculpt from a sculptor over in Spain whose name is uh, Raul Garcia Slatore um, the easiest way I found to find this guy, if you're looking for this exact model, is if you if you Google 54 mm, like 54 millimeter, 54 millimeter Nash N A S H, you should be able to find it. It's like the second link, I think. It's uh, Raul's website. Um, there's Oogly with the uh, with the link there. Uh, currently, he's out of stock unless you want to get the 75 millimeter version, which is even bigger than this one. This is the 54 millimeter sculpt. Um, and it's a limited thing. He, he only does limited run um, castings of his sculpts. So uh, as far as I know, I could be wrong, so don't quote me on this. But as far as I know, when they're gone, they're gone. And I don't know if he's going to do any more. So he, this guy is a pretty exclusive model. Yeah, um, he's got a couple of other things that are kind of in this style. The other stuff that I've seen him do is very... Um, it's a lot more realistic and kind of historical in nature. But like I said, if you really, really want this model and you don't mind him being a little bit bigger in 75 mil, you can definitely get the 75 mil version. Troll Slayer tattoo. Yeah, he's going to have some tattoos. He's going to have the orange hair. He's, he's going to be a modern day Troll Slayer. That's kind of what we're going for. Which is why we're doing the blue pants and all that. Let's set up a little bit. All right, so now what we're gonna do is go up to uh, blue green from Vallejo Model Color. Also gonna be working very thin with this, so literally like one or two drops in the airbrush here. Just a little bit and then a lot of flow improver. Sleeve, um, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm actually not a fan of sleeves myself, but we can definitely give them some tattoos. When it comes to tattoos, especially on miniatures, um, less is definitely more. So 
So we can definitely give him like a really cool kind of like um, like Slayer tattoo on the shoulder that kind of bleeds over into the chest in the back. That's kind of what my plan was. But as far as like sleeves and stuff, nah. Like he's already got these little um, these little like uh, bracelets on with uh, with cool stuff. And I don't want to get rid. I don't want to draw away from the sculpt of the musculature by doing like a bunch of really intricate tattoos on him. See how our transition's coming in now with that blue green. I like that. You creep that over a little bit right here. Yeah, much better. Do the same thing on this leg. The Savage Triple Seven. Thanks for that follow. Highlight there, I like so. You know, as I'm looking at it, I think yeah, I think we, yeah we will go up into more of that blue green or not blue green, but uh, kind of faded denim look. I'm, I'm actually thinking it might work after putting the blue green on there. Streets of Rage. I don't think I ever played Streets of Rage. Megalomania. Thanks for that follow. Okay, let's get this color. Yeah. So I got a color here, um, dark blue pale, which on camera looks kind of gray. It looks like a normal basic ass gray, but it does have some blue content to it. And I think it's going to be the color that we need to get us that faded denim look. Just a tiny little bit. You can see like just the tiniest amount of that paint, right? And then we're gonna get some flow improver going. We might actually end up going all the way up to pure white. Depends on depends on if I'm feeling it or not. I gotta kind of see what this is gonna do. See what the model is gonna tell us. Okay. Still a little bit. And give some air to this part of the, the pants right here. It's a little wet. Let's see. Yeah, I like that a lot better. I think that's getting it. It's getting us that faded look.
Yeah. And I think we are gonna go up to a pure white. Just because we do need to apply a wash to these jeans. And normally when you apply a wash, you wanna, before you apply a wash, you wanna go a little bit brighter than you're actually comfortable with because the wash is gonna darken everything down, so. I think going up to just like the tiniest amount of pure white on these jeans is gonna be right where we need it to when we put that wash on. So I'm not gonna do pure white. I'll show you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna rinse out the airbrush. So this is what we're working with, some watery remnants of that dark blue pale. Just kind of a weird name that it's not like dark pale blue, like we would normally say it, but yeah, the color is called Dark Blue Pale. And in into the watery remains of that color, we're just gonna pour some of our Steinol Res White Primer. No, I'm not. I'm gonna use Slow Fuse White because it speckles less. What am I thinking? So yeah, we're gonna use our Hobo Weight from slowfusegaming.com. A little bit of that in there and we're going to use some flow improver and I'm actually going to put a couple of drops of actual airbrush thinner in here as well and this should get us the color that i'm looking for make sure this is mixed up nice and good yeah, so probably on camera, this is gonna look pure white. So yeah, on camera it looks pure white, but you can see it's it's an off-white, it's not pure white. That's what we're looking for. Uh, speckling, so... I don't know if it's gonna do it because I actually mixed my paint up pretty good, but um, here you can see. So see like here, fuck. Okay, so see like here and kind of in some of these other airbrush areas that I did on our palette here, how there's like little teeny tiny specks of paint. There it is, see? Around our spray pattern. See all those little specks that kind of shoot out around the edge of it? That's what I'm talking about. And usually what that means is that your paint is not mixed up thin enough to push through the airbrush. And you get those like big fat specks of, of airbrush paint shooting out because it should be it should be like seamless it should just be super soft when you're when you're airbrushing again i'm going to give this a little bit of air on this knee before i put paint on it because it's a little wet still And I think that's all of the white that I want to put on there. This paint is incredibly thin, so I got to be really careful as I'm building it up so it doesn't pool on us. And generally what I'm talking about when I say pooling is if you're spraying, I don't want to use my wash thing. Um, where is something I can, I can air? Oh. So generally what I'm saying is like when you're, when you're airbrushing stuff, and you're just laying paint down if you that's what i'm talking about i know that's like excessive but when you're when you're airbrushing see how it's starting to, if i hold the air too long and the paint is too wet see how it's like pushing a, that paint out as it's see that that's what we're talking about with pooling you definitely don't want that because not only does that you have to paint over that, but when you do that, it creates a three-dimensional like little bump of of paint that's not smooth. So it can it can really mess up stuff. An airbrush tutorial on what? Speckling? Um no, because it's just you have to learn how to mix paint. Uh, 
Um, that's one of the few things about airbrushing that's just kind of like you need to learn on your own because it's it's about trigger control and muscle memory. And with mixing paint, like, I know you've probably heard it a million times, but, like, getting the consistency of milk with your paint is actually, like, pretty true. And I don't really need to do a video on that because it's, like, one sentence of, of tutorial. And that's basically, like, you want to put in enough thinner or enough flow improver that after you stir up your paint, you can drag your brush across the lip of the airbrush cup. And if it runs down the airbrush cup smoothly like milk, then you're probably good to go. Okay. So yeah, I'm liking where that's at. He's got those, those faded jeans on. Hopefully this guy doesn't come out looking like a fucking... Abercrombie and Fitch ad for dwarves. But I think those are pretty cool jeans to start off. Much cooler than just blue pants. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and Dirthu713 with a sub. Thanks for that sub, man. I appreciate that. Or lady. Get some hype in the stream for Dirthu. Coming in. Being part of the Jet Clips family, that subscription. The hype train has pulled into the station. All aboard. Choo choo. Yeah. All right. So our next step is going to be. To work on these boots because. The wash that I want to use should be good enough to use with both. So we can go ahead and start painting on our boots and then do a uh, gloss coat and wash like as, as one step with them. Okay. And, hmm, I don't know. Like, I'm a little bit torn. Maybe some of you people that know fashion better than me, like, should we do the boots brown? Because I thought brown was the shoes that you normally wear with, like, blue blue trousers or, or jeans. So it's like, should we do some, like, really faded, worn-in, like, brown leather boots? Or should we go, like, full black military boots? What do you guys think? <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's a good joke. I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause that was that was what was really big when I was in high school. It was like if you is everybody wanted Hollister. Depends on the belt. <laughs> The belt's probably going to be black because it's a it's like a military belt. It's the you see it's like the um, fuck it's like the military clasp style belt. So we're just going to do that black. But I don't know. I'm just thinking like in my head. I think with the jeans, like the faded jeans, I think some like really broken in like brown leather boots would uh, would look really good. Um, alternatively, if we did some black leather boots, those would also look good. It's just like, I can't really tell kind of like, I, I can't decide. Plus I like to involve you guys in the color decisions and kind of the direction that we go with the model. So let's go Joe. Oh, God, terrible answer. It's like asking somebody where they want to eat and they say, I don't care. But then they get pissed off if you go to something and they, they actually did care. It's a test. Yeah, we could do like the military surplus route and do like some, some olive drab on it too. That probably would end up looking okay. 
it's just there's so little of it showing. There's not a whole lot we can do with it, right? So I think like the only place you see that belt is that one section in the front. It's that one place because everything else is covered by the chain and the grenades. Yeah, the what do you want to eat question. Ugh. Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing some votes on some worn out brown leather. Okay, I think we can do that. Yo, he's a slayer. They don't fuck around, man. Like Let's just say that a slayer is never without a weapon. Reddish Jock Martins. <laughs> Let's see. What do I want to start with? Probably some some charred brown. Work up off of that. If I can find my charred brown. Got a little bit of beastie brown left. We might end up using some of that. And then the question is, where did I put my charred brown? There it is. Ooh, I have almost none of this left. I think we should be able to cover it though. Shameless, yeah. You're doubly right. All right, so we got our Vallejo game color charred brown. Well, Vallejo game air, actually. Again, just super thin coat. Probably not going to cover in one coat, but that's fine. Be kind of careful where we get up next to our pants here. Maybe in this reality, the Slayers are like, are like the Dwarf Army Special Forces. This dude's like an old, old retired Slayer. I don't know. Just thinking of, thinking of like headcanon for our like modern day Troll Slayer guy. Because he's got the dog tags as well. Trying to get these areas to butt up next to the, the G. 
machines. Got to be really careful. We don't get brown where we don't want it. I want to make sure that you can see what I'm doing and that I can see what I'm doing also. Angles are a bit tricky. We got one coat on there, and we'll just switch on over to the the other boot. That's almost a little too thin. And we'll just do a coat on this one, and hopefully by the time we get done with this coat, we can go back to the left boot and give that a second coat. Being real careful up next to these sections where this boot is touching the pants. So we got a coat on there and I'm actually going to give our other boot just a little bit of dry time. Some of it's still looking a little wet and I don't want to do a second coat on top of that because you might end up just pushing that paint around, tearing it up. So I just want that to dry up a little bit more before we do a second coat. Let him kind of chill out for a second. about half hour left in the show tonight right on schedule um i usually completely rinse it out um 
talking about this stuff. Yeah, I almost always, um, like, you know, you lather it up really good and get a lot of that paint out of there and then rinse it out. Do that a couple of times and then, um, you know, rinse it out and then just, like, pull your point back on, like, a paper towel or whatever and then just leave it as is. It might it might leave the brush a little stiff, but if you just swish it in some water, it'll it'll be fine. Water, get off! There it is. Ugly? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I like it. I like the idea of doing it this way rather than what we were gonna do. I think it gives them a lot more character than just having to be like just brown or uh, blue pants. Having the kind of faded jeans look to them looks really nice. I think it'll be uh, it'll be really cool, especially around the back. I mean, yeah, getting that getting that kind of like stonewashed jean look out of these is like really cool. I think it's gonna look neat. And even even after we put a wash on there, like we're not done with the jeans. Like once once the um, the initial airbrushing stuff is done, and we do put a wash on there, and that's dry, and we matte coat it back. Like there's gonna be some hand painting that needs to get done uh, to pick out all those little folds and details and stuff. And that's where we can also come in with the the hand brush and do some do some glazing technique and stuff with some of that kind of bluish off white that we were using to get that faded look. Get those kind of faded folds in the pants um and lock in that uh lock in that look a reflection um probably not gonna try to do a full-on reflection um uh i was just gonna pull something out of kenny's book and just do you know some some sunglasses some, some nice dark sunglasses i'm not like I, I think this is like the third model i've ever painted with sunglasses on it so i'm not like the most experienced when it comes to doing those kinds of effects and um i would rather do a technique that i know and execute it well to go along with the rest of the really nice execution on the model than try something new and have it look shitty hope that makes sense I wonder if I like, touched his nose or something with my finger. It's like a little bit of a little bit of like a blue tint on his uh, his nose there. I'm fix that with some wash. I had planned on going into some of the larger details on his flesh tone too, and the kind of reestablishing those those shaded areas with some pin washing. I don't even think you can see it on camera. There it is. Like this is like the I must have like touched it, touched his nose with my finger or something. But that's fine. All right, let's see if we can do another coat on our boots here.
We can play it kind of fast and loose on these areas down here, but when we get up next to the pants, gotta slow it down. Be really careful. Okay, solid base coat on our boots there. Looking nice. Let's see, uh, maybe like a little bit. There's a couple of places that seem like they're a little bit thinner on camera. With the aid of the world, since we'll be aging those up using the airbrush, some brighter and brighter browns up to some tan colors. And then at the very end of the model, we'll be doing some free handy kind of stuff, like some little scratchies on the leather boots as well. So just let that dry up a little bit and then we'll bust out the airbrush. <clears throat> yeah, so I've got some browns here. So I've got um, some flat brown, some mahogany brown, uh, some beastie brown, and then we'll probably need to find a uh, like a tan color, kind of like a tannish leather color. Maybe nope, that's a that's a texture paint. Mm, not liking that. Maybe uh, something like handlewood from Secret Weapon here. See, it's that. The transition between the Beastie Brown and this is what's really going to age it up. So that'll probably work out really nicely. And I'm going to go ahead and put away our blues just so that I don't forget to do it later. So that way I don't end up having a ton of paints out in front of me. So I've still got our flesh paints out from the YouTube video. Go ahead and put those away. We're done with slow fuse white for the time being. And the dark pale blue, put that away. You can just leave our browns out. Speaking of slow fuse, there he is with an auto host. Appreciate that auto host. Let's see, give this guy a little air. Help this paint dry up a little quicker. And like I was saying at the beginning of the stream, like if if uh, if you're one of those people that really likes to challenge themselves and like get out of your comfort zone, um, so to speak, and like really try to flex those hobby muscles, like moving from a 28 or a 32 millimeter scale up to the 54 mil is a lot of fun because you can really try out those techniques that you may be like a little too f afraid to use on a 28 mil. Um, because you, it's on a larger scale, you have a little bit more room to work with. 
and I, like I don't want to say that it's easier to accomplish because you know like it's painting like you need to you know take your time and uh, don't use the scale as a reason to just be sloppy but moving up into those larger scales can be a lot of fun because you can you can really kind of spread your wings a little bit and work on those techniques. Besides something twenty eight, yeah, I've got a I've got a fire baby over here. So this is a this is one of the Shade Spire Slayers, um, and I'll try to line up their feet because he's like standing on this skull here, uh, about like so. So yeah, you can see the scale difference. So yeah, he's much bigger than the normal dwarf. And I mean, there's other stuff in the 28 scale that's like kind of creeping into that 54. Like if we look at our devil dog from Infinity, like all of the detail on him is sculpted in a 28 mil scale, but his proportions themselves are closer to a 54. So you can see he's like, he's still like a little small in the, in like the bulk department, but he's getting into that, that kind of size. Because I think this, so this guy is sculpted kind of like fantasy dwarves are, where like they're not, they're not like little people. They're just like shorter, stockier humanoids. So like most, most dwarves in say like Age of Sigmar would still come up to like right here. It's just their proportions are so different. So they're not like at your knees or something. I don't have an Ogren handy. But yeah, he could be a cool Ogren. You know, he's about that big. He's actually probably a little bit bigger than an Ogren. Like, a little taller. But yeah, if you if you really wanted to, you could have him be like a really badass Ogren. Alright, so I'm going to start off with our flat brown. For our initial highlight. It's going to be a really subtle uh, transition between this and our chart brown. Again, we're working pretty thin here, so lots of flow improver. And we're going to have to be kind of careful with some of these airbrushing steps because we're going to be getting up really close to that brown, or to that uh, that jeans, the, the blue the blue jeans that we just, uh, we just airbrushed. So definitely don't want to be spraying brown all up on them. I'm actually going to turn down my air a little bit. This is why I love my Sotar. So I can get right up next to stuff. Okay. So see, fairly subtle between the charred brown and the flat brown, but we're getting, starting up our workout. Just 
and rinse that out. But I've got a little bit of it left in the cups. You can see I got that kind of watery remains. And we're going to go up to our mahogany brown. Start doing our initial kind of highlight stage. So think of the flat brown as just something to kind of help out the uh, the charred brown be a little more opaque. Help to make it a little bit more uniform because it's such a subtle color difference. And then we're going to do our first initial highlight with the mahogany brown, which is a little bit brighter. It's gonna, it's kind of a, I always describe it as a little bit of like an orangey brown. It's got a little bit of that to it. And get where all those little creases are in the leather. The leather has become soft and broken down. Want it to get lighter and lighter. Like that. Creature caster, what's up? How's it going, homie? Oops. Creature caster fine purveyor of really scary models with amazing sculpts. You've seen me paint some of their stuff here on stream before. The pleasure of meeting the Creature Caster team at Adepticon. gonna go to Beastie Brown. that. I'm going to get a little bit on this. Little tongue of the boot there. OK. 
Okay. Like that. Yeah, I think I'm going to end up having to do the same thing, Kalini. If I want to actually stay at the Renaissance. All right, now we're going to go up to our secret weapon miniatures Handlewood color. And this is kind of what's going to lock in the, the weathered effect of the boots. is because you're going to get into that aged, well-worn, scuffed-up leather look. That's kind of that tan leather. When you see the, uh, like you see like brown, what started off as like dark rich brown, like maybe cowboy boots or something like that. And after a long time of being worn in, they get that kind of harsh transition between dark rich leather and like very tan leather. Got this really thin. Focusing on the toes. These areas with lots of, lots of creases in them. I like that. I need a little bit of help on this side. Kind of around the sole there. And of course, like I said, after the step where we put the wash on, a lot of this is going to become more defined. The detail is going to pop out a little bit more to help lock in that look and then we go into final stage where we're hand highlighting all these little creases and the laces and we're going to be putting in all those little leather scratchies on there to really weather them up and lock in that effect it's going to look great but so far just the soft airbrushy stuff is looking really nice i think i think we made a good call i'm gonna i'm gonna let you guys have that one so you guys made a really good call on the weathered brown boots rather than black boots frames are dropping mm. Mm. Let's see I see a little a little alert thingy wonder if that's what it was telling me yeah I did catch a little jitter out of the out of the corner of my eye while I was airbrushing. It might just be because of something down here. I don't know. What is the saying? Oh yeah, it's saying there's like some little frame skips. It's probably just some something going on with the internet. Yeah, probably just temporary. We were having a little bit of some internet jitters last night. It was storming real bad last night, so maybe it's like an after effect of some of that stuff. Maybe the network is having some trouble. Yeah. So he's looking mighty fine. I really like the way that's coming together. Those boots are looking good. 
a little harder to lock in the boots uh, than it was than it is with the jeans because you can do a lot of the jeans with just color, and it locks in that effect to your to your brain. Um, you just read that the way that you're supposed to. Like, oh, those are just like washed out jeans, right? Got it. With the boots, um, you need that wash. You need um, that extra mile of like hand painting, uh, getting all those details popped out, getting those little textures painted in um, to get that effect across. But so far, it's looking good. Like, I like where it's at right now. So I'm going to go ahead and um, since we're just right about at quitting time, I'm going to run some cleaner through the airbrush and we're going to give this guy a gloss coat before we get out of here so that can dry overnight. And uh, between the streams, I'll go ahead and put the washes on there and matte coat it back so we can get right back to painting next time. Gloss varnish. We're going to be using our Vallejo gloss varnish out of the airbrush here. Not only is it going to protect all the painting that we just did, but it's going to lower the surface tension of the model so that when we apply a wash, the uh, the wash will flow over the uh, model very easily, and it won't want to stay on big flat surfaces and stain. It's going to run into all those details. That's what we want. And I've been running into some issues with the gloss varnish if you don't give it enough time to set, which causes it to kind of pimple up a little bit. Usually you can't even tell afterwards, like it did it on this guy. And I challenge you to tell me where it, it did that because you just can't tell. But I want to stop uh, doing that. So I want it to stop doing that. Oh, maybe it scratched his back with my fingernail or something. Oh well, that can be fixed. But for right now, we're just gonna give this guy a protective coat with our gloss varnish. If we get any on the flesh, that's fine. Just gonna protect it even more. Gonna go ahead and get these forearms on the off chance that when I'm applying wash, maybe like flick some wash onto his hands or something, and I don't want it to stain. So I'll just go ahead and get them too while we're here. I like that. So now the bottom half is super shiny, and we're just gonna set him aside and let him dry up. And then immediately clean out our airbrush because if you haven't heard me say it before, if you use varnishes in your airbrush, immediately run some cleaner through there, run some actual airbrush cleaner through there, get that stuff cleaned out because if that varnish dries, especially the gloss varnish, if it dries inside of your airbrush, it is bad news bears. You do not want to have to strip that stuff out of there. So I always give it a nice cleaning with some airbrush cleaner and run some of that through the airbrush to make sure I don't have any of that varnish dry out. Cut off the compressor. Ah. Just go ahead and have that. Just go ahead, that bleed while we're getting out of here. All right, so got quite a bit of work done today. I mean, we were taking our time, so I know it's not like we finished a model or anything, but 
for what we wanted to accomplish, uh, we got a lot of work done. Like I said, we were going to focus on the pants. We we're going to focus on the boots. We got all of our airbrushing done. We got all of our initial highlights and all that done with our airbrush workups on the pants and on the boots. Got a gloss coat on here that's drying right now. And like I said, between streams, I'm going to let this set up overnight, come back in it in the morning, throw our washes on there, let those dry up nice and dry, mat coat it back. So then when we come back tomorrow night, we can continue working on something else. And then that's probably the rest of him you'll see this week. Um, Saturday and Sunday, we're going to be working on a different, a different project, probably something closer to 40 K. Um, not entirely sure yet, but you know, I like to alternate between other stuff and, and 40 K and like other stuff and Sigmar and that kind of thing. So we'll probably come back to a, uh, like a 40 K project, uh, this weekend. I'm thinking maybe we'll work on the OG demon prints. That might be fun. Um, and then of course the next YouTube video is going to be on this guy doing some more uh, techniques on him and then you'll see him again next week we're gonna be working on him slowly but surely throughout the uh, the rest of this month so look forward to it and like I said uh, once this guy is complete he is gonna be a uh, giveaway up for grabs for you guys in the chat and we're gonna be doing that at kind of the midpoint of next month because that's when uh, at the end of this month start of start of June at the end of this month we're gonna be um, rolling out our new giveaway system for painted models um, and that's also when uh, club points are gonna reset so uh, if you're new to the channel make sure you come back watch all of our streams for the rest of this month get all those club points that you can and um, near the end of this month we're gonna be doing kind of a, a clubs point fire sale get rid of all those clubs points we'll be doing a, a big fancy go to hell giveaway like a big giant swag bag giveaway for hitting 1500 followers so make sure that you don't miss that um and then once we get into june we're going to be on the new system we're going to be gaining those club points building those up up to the midpoint of june when this guy is going to go live as the giveaway and that's where you're going to be able to get your hands on him and then we're going to do a second one at the end of june so that's our new system is we're going to be doing two uh painted giveaways like painted stream project giveaways per month one at the midpoint one at the end point um, and when we get closer to that rolling out, I'll, I'll, uh, put out all the information. We'll promote it. So that way you can be prepared for it. Um, if you haven't already do exclamation point Facebook and follow that link over to the Jack Club's Facebook page. That's where we put out all of our social media stuff related to the channel. So when I'm going live, what projects we're doing and any information for, um, our promotional stuff like this guy here, that's where you'll be able to find it first. Uh, I also post all of our finished studio photos there. So if you want to go and check out any of our past projects, all the photos are up there on that Facebook page. And of course, once this guy is done, that's where all the photos will be as well. And we also have a YouTube channel. So if you hit exclamation point YouTube, the bot will spit out a link to the YouTube channel. And if you want to see how we built up the flesh workup on this guy, that was this week's YouTube video. You can go check that out. Um, really, really nice video. It was a lot of fun to do the flesh workup on this guy. Super short, sweet to the point. Um, so it's a little bit shorter than uh, what we've been doing because the last couple of videos before him were like full, uh, how to paint, like start to finish. So because this is a tutorial series, those videos are going to be a little bit more bite-sized. So look forward to those. Um, with that, let's find somebody to host. Let's see who's online painting. Let's see, this guy could use some love. All right, so if you're new to the channel, Make sure to look below the channel, uh, the stream video. There's a little widget there that tells you exactly when we're going live and on what days. And it's in your time zone. So if you're in Western time, it's it's in Western time. If you're in Eastern time, it's in Eastern time. If you're in like crazy Canadian time, it's in Canadian time. Um, so that's when we're uh, going to be live. So next stream will be tomorrow evening. Um, so make sure to check it out. We're going to be working on this guy again. And then uh, Saturday and Sunday, we'll be doing a, a different project, probably a start to finish project over those two streams. It's usually how I like to do smaller projects so you can see the whole thing. Um, we're going to throw a host over to Kinetic Medic. So a really fun streamer here. He's painting up some stuff. So 
Um, like normal, wait for that host to go through and then jump over to his channel so that raid is as big as possible. Tell him I sent you, hit him with the hobby love, hit him with those Jack Out Clubs emotes if you got them, and I will see all of you beautiful people tomorrow.